we've come to our very final session, session 12. And session 12 is drugs used in obstetrics. In obstetrics, there are various types of drugs that we use in obstetrics. And during pregnancy and the puerperium, the drugs must be administered with maximum caution, especially during the first two weeks of the first trimester. We know that this is a time where organogenesis takes place. The part of the fetus is being formed into organs. And if you take in any drug that is contraindicated, the rate of malformation is very, very high around this stage. This may be prescribed over the counter medications. When considering the use of any medication in pregnancy, labor and puerperium, it is important to consider the effects of the drugs on the mother and then the growing fetus or the neonates. Sometimes the woman could even be lactating, but because the drugs could be passed on through the breast milk, they are contraindicated. This session will look at teratogen, that is drugs that, are, that can cross the placental barrier and cause harm to the fetus. They are not only drugs, but radiation and other things. And then those that are used during pregnancy, and then the puerperium. By the end of this session, it is important that you'll be able to explain the pharmacotherapeutic basis of drug recommended in abnormal pregnancy, labor and puerperium. You describe how pregnancy can influence the effect of drugs and effectively manage the side effects of drugs. Example, magnesium sulfate. That's our major reading. Effect of drugs in pregnancy. In pregnancy, transfer of drugs across the placenta. There could be transfer across the placenta barrier and also in the breast, also through the breast milk. The influence of pregnancy on drug dose and then adverse effect of drugs in pregnancy and teratogen. Now, when the woman is pregnant, what is the influence of pregnancy on drug dose? Sometimes for the sake of pregnancy, some dosages must be altered, sometimes reduced or increased so that we take the pregnancy into consideration. For instance, when we're talking about the heparin, if it's a thrombosis in any other condition, you can, you can go on heparin to dissolve the clot. But when we were talking about it in pregnancy, we said very low doses. So the influence of pregnancy on the drug. Now, pregnancy can also change the absorption rates of the drug. So in some drugs, you may need a higher amount to be able to cause a similar effect that you could have achieved in the non-pregnant stage. Drugs, these are the very common drugs used in obstetrics, and you bear with me that if you want to go through all these drugs that we are going into a pharmacology class, for obstetric class, you want to look at all these drugs, these are the major classification. You will not be able to take them one by one and handle them. You mention some few, the commonly used ones, and then we'll look at their effects. These are also drugs used in labor. In labor, basically, we need prostaglandins, we need oxytocins, and then the ergometrines. We also use drugs during, and then drugs and breastfeeding. There are drugs that may affect milk production, and there are some that will suppress the milk production. So if you are giving any drug during the puerperium, we are careful of these effects. We want to find out, can it affect, can it be passed on through the milk? Will it get any effect on the fetus? Can it suppress lactation? For instance, if you're using a drug like Cibustrol, which is an estrogen preparation, it suppresses lactation and prevents lactation completely. The breast will be dry and all the milk will dry up. Now, there is transfer of drugs across the placenta and also through the breast milk. In a normal pregnancy, we say the placenta forms a barrier and then we have what we call the placental barrier. What it does is that it doesn't allow very big molecules of substances to pass through the placenta. So some microorganisms cannot pass through the placenta. Some medications can also not pass through the placenta. Now, if you have very virulent organisms, they can still cross this barrier. And it's the same for some medications. They can still cross the placenta barrier. So a drug administered to the pregnant woman or a breastfeeding mother will in most cases be present in the blood circulating around the body. Exceptions are certain types of drugs that are not absorbed from areas where they are administered. Example, some skin creams. Because sometimes we even have some topical application or creams which goes into circulation to affect the pregnancy. The maternal blood circulation will then take the drugs to the placenta or to the breast, and which are organs designed to allow the passage of substances 
from maternal blood to either fetal blood or milk, respectively. The drug will pass across into the fetus or neonates in greater or lesser quantities, depending on the characteristics of the drug molecules themselves. I think we have explained this earlier on, that the larger molecules will not be able to pass through. Now, the characteristics of the drug, what is the size of the molecules? What is the ionization process? Is it a lipid base or water soluble? Is it protein binding? In general, large molecules do not cross the placenta and small molecules cross very easily. Influence of pregnancy on drug dose. We have said earlier on that a lot of physiological changes occur during pregnancy. For instance, there is gastric emptying time may be increased, the woman eats and the food may stay on her for a long time or a very short time. So depending on what happens to the gastric emptying time, it affects the medication. So if you take a medication, the gastric emptying time is very short. It means that it will not be fully absorbed, but then it will be excreted through the feces. The circulating plasma volume. The volume now goes up during pregnancy. Remember we said that plasma volume is very high. So if the circulating plasma volume is high, then the blood can get to the tissues very fast. Increase in excretion rates during pregnancy, which is a normal physiology. Increase in total body weight and fats. Increase in metabolic pathway. Changes in levels of plasma proteins. And because all these things are normal physiological processes in pregnancy, they also affect drug doses. Either they increase the absorption rate or they decrease the absorption rate. Many drugs have adverse effects during pregnancy and these vary depending on the stage of the pregnancy. Already we have said that the first trimester, if possible, the first two weeks, which is for organogenesis and the fetus, we should avoid any type of medication because very mild medications that are even over the counter could become teratogenic even at that stage. It is therefore advisable for clinicians to use drugs that have been available for a long time and with more information. Now if you go to some antenatal clinic, they are prescribing all sorts of medications and sometimes they feel that, especially the motivate, that the richer you are, you have to go on to a very higher supplement. Some of these things have not been researched into and the effect on the fetus have also not been researched into and they could be teratogens. Now if we say something is a teratogen, it refers to any substance that leads to the birth of a malformed baby. Organogenesis, we have said, occurs between approximately this number of days post-conception. And if any drug that can cause structural abnormality in the fetus, then we say that it is a teratogen. So commonly used drugs that are teratogens, we have lithium. Lithium is also given, but then it has an effect of cardiac defects. When we were mentioning a drug for thrombophlebitis, we didn't mention warfarin, we said heparin. Warfarin is linked with facial abnormalities in the fetus. We also have a drug called sodium valproate, which causes neural tube defects. And phenytoin, this ordinary phenytoin that we use, can also cause craniofacial abnormality in the fetus. So our commonly used drugs that are safe, we have a folic acid, and it is recommended that all women, even planning to become pregnant, should go on folic acid before pregnancy even sets in. Because once they go on folic acid, it prevents a lot of chromosomal abnormalities in the fetus when they become pregnant. If they don't take it before pregnancy, then they should take it during pregnancy. And then we also have the iron preparations. I think we have mentioned those things in our antenatal care. Ferrous sulfate, ferrous gluconate, which are also administered routinely to women at the antenatal clinic. We have antacids, we all know antacids, the calcium salt, magnesium sulfate, aluminum sulfate. We know these drugs already. We're not, like I said, we can't have a pharmacological class. We want to look at their users during pregnancy and they are relatively non-absorbable and they are safe for use in pregnancy because we can't have a, a big portion of it or a higher portion of it being absorbed into the bloodstream, only very small. However, older antacids such as sodium valproate can cause systemic alkalosis and should be avoided. Then we have anti-emetics. Anti-emetics means that it prevents nausea and vomiting. And these drugs, most of them have also been found to be having very serious effect on the fetus. Some cause malformations in the fetus. So nausea and vomiting, if it is, the woman cannot bear with it, it goes beyond body sickness, it's becoming severe then we need 
some antibiotics, but they shouldn't be abused. There are four main categories. We have the antihistamines, we have anticholinergics, we have antidopanergic, we have the 5-HT3 receptor antagonist. And all these things are, all these are anti-emetics. So cyclizin is the commonly used one. And some also use the prochlorperazin. And this may cause dramatic side effects. So we are saying that all these things are drugs that could be used, but then look for the ones that, have, that are used commonly and are used often and uh, there have not been any registered side effects. If you use these drugs that have not been researched into very well, or you want to just go, sometimes when they go to, excuse me, maybe in course they're very private ones, and some want to show that, I don't want to give you the drug that is given at the government hospitals in quotes. Then they go on to higher forms of medications, and then the women also like it because, oh, yeah, I wasn't given ordinary vitamin B complex, I was given maybe pro-woman or something, and they get excited. Sometimes some of these medications might not have been researched so much into. We also have antibiotics, and antibiotics are considered safe in pregnancy, and not all of them are safe. There are some that are contraindicated during pregnancy. So you, those are, that are considered safe in pregnancy are the ones that are listed below, the penicillins, the erythromycins, the clindamycins, the trimethoprins. And then the cephalosporins have also been found to be effective. So something like cefuroxime is commonly used. Amoxicillin and amoxiclav are also commonly used. The antibiotics that can cause adverse side effects commonly is tetracyclines. If you use tetracyclines, you may be born, you may give birth to a baby with a blue, a yellow teeth, sorry. A discoloration of the teeth, the teeth may become yellowish if you take tetracyclines during pregnancy. The discoloration also occurs also in the fetal bones and then when used in second and third stage of trimester. So if you take it, depending on what development is going on at that particular time, you have the discoloration of the particular organ being developed at that time. So you give birth to this baby and the teeth is yellow even at birth. We also have the aminoglyco aminoglycosides, including gentamicin. I remember that now it is, it is scarcely used because of the high level of toxicity that has been linked with the use of gentamicin. We have chloramphenicol, the risk, you have gray baby syndrome, when used in second and third stages. We have nitrofurantoin, the risk is that you have hemolysis in the fetus at term. Then the crinolines, which is ciprofloxacin and ofloxacin, of ofloxavine. They can also cause atrophy, arthropathy in the fetus. Most of this evidence has been obtained from animal studies. We have analgesics. We know the commonly used analgesics in pregnancy. It is safer to go on the paracetamol for a start unless otherwise indicated. It's advisable that the medication, if it's apart from paracetamol, then it should be prescribed by an obstetrician. We have the opiate analgesics like the pethidines, the morphines. They are also commonly used in pregnancy and also around the time of delivery for pain. And then aspirin. In analgesic doses, aspirin has been shown to increase the risk of maternal, fetal, and neonatal bleeding because you know it's an anticoagulant and it's an antiplatelet. Aspirin as an analgesic dose is therefore contraindicated in pregnancy. So in pregnancy, if you are using aspirin, it is not for analgesic. Maybe we are using it because of a clot. So a common analgesic dose is 600 milligrams every six hours. Aspirin in these doses is present in many commercially available cold remedies and analgesic preparations. So we have said that already, that low doses of aspirin is, however, tolerable during pregnancy, 75 milligrams daily. So we have come from the 600 milligrams, which is the normal, to 75. It tells you that not even half or one third, very, very low dose of aspirin is tolerable during pregnancy. We have the antihypertensives. You, you've done hypertension, so you know all these drugs already. We have the methyl dopa, 
which is also called the, commonly called the aldomet, and then we have the beta blockers. We have the example CA, which you know already. We also have the calcium channel blockers, the nifidipines. Nifidipine is commonly used, and uh, nicardipine and all the others. You have hydralazine used in acute hypertensions. So all these things, you've done them in medicine, and you're familiar with their use and then their effects. Drugs for diabetes mellitus, we have the oral hypoglycemics, we have the metformin, often used in infertility treatments in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, and then we have insulin, mainstay of diabetic treatments in pregnancy. Then we have drugs that we use when the woman has asthma. They are all familiar drugs that you know. In asthma, we have inhaled bronchodilators, the salbutamol inhalers, and then we have the inhaled chromoglycate sodium, chromoglycate inhalers. We have the oral corticosteroids, like the prednisolone, the dexamethasones, and then we have the theophyllins. And then we have anticoagulants used. The two main coagulants are warfarin and heparin, but like we said earlier on, heparin is sometimes preferable. Then we have tocolytics. The tocolytics, what they do is that they reduce activity. They cause relaxation. So when they are used in pregnancy, they want to, we, want, we use it when we have increase in contractions. So the woman is not at 10 yet, but she's having premature uterine contractions. A drug like cybutamol is, or ventolin, it is normally used for asthma to dilate the bronchioles, but it has also been found to be very useful in obstetrics as a tocolytic so that it controls or minimizes or it's, it's able to relax the uterine muscles and prevent further contractions. So ritodrine is also used and then tebutalin is also used. These are associated with maternal side effects such as palpitations and tremor, nausea, vomiting, test restlessness, chest pain and breathlessness. So when you give these drugs, you watch out for these side effects and then you know how to counteract them. The tocolytic drugs, some insects have also been found to have tocolytic effects and then the nifedipines have also been found to have some tocolytic effects. We also have what we call the oxytocin antagonist. The oxytocin is for contractions. So any drug that is oxytocin antagonist is a drug that will minimize contractions. So all oxytocin antagonists are also tocolytics. Magnesium sulfate has also been found to be a very useful tocolytic. We realize that that one was also used initially to treat ulcers and also for, for some abdominal conditions, but modern obstetric has found it very useful. Then we have the corticosteroids, and this may be contraindicated in pregnancy for pre-existing maternal diseases such as asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, and other inflammatory diseases. Example, nisolone, intravenous, hydrocortisone, and prednisolone. Magnesium sulfate is a very common drug used, and like I said, it's a discovery of the century if it comes to obstetric practice. Earlier on, all we knew was its association with ulcers, gastric ulcers. Uh, it is used in the treatment of eclampsia, and it, it, it exerts its effects as a cerebral vessel dilator, thereby reserving cerebral vessel spasms and increasing cerebral blood flow so that it prevents twitching. It is given intramuscularly or intravenously, and this drug should be given with so much caution. And if you don't have the antidote to this drug, you don't administer this drug. The toxicity effect is very high, though it's a very useful drug. It can only be, con the, the toxicity, if you want to experience the adverse effect, you need calcium gluconate to adverse the toxic effect, or that is the antidote for the toxicity effect. If you don't have calcium gluconate, you don't administer magnesium sulfate, because if not, the next moment this patient will have cardiac arrest. We also have the prostaglandins. The lipid molecules responsible for multiple physiological subcellular reactions. The important prostaglandin in labor and purpurium are the PGE and the PGF, and they are administered by any roots, but as indicated, or side effects when given orally. Prostaglandin E2 is given via vaginal roots because of the relative lack of side effects from this root. So you take it through the vagina and it causes dilatation of the cervix. We have mysoprostol. 
uh, it's also another discovery. Master postal is a prostaglandin in analog widely used for cervical ripening and for the management of postpartum hemorrhage, usually administered vaginally. It's also one of the discoveries of the century in terms of obstetrics, and it's been found that when you give this to the woman, even rectally, after delivery, two tablets, it prevents postpartum hemorrhage. There are other ones like the prostaglandin F2 alpha and then the carboprost. Then we come to our famous oxytocin. Oxytocin is widely used and it's a naturally occur occurring hormone that exerts a simulatory effect on myometrial contractility. The effect of oxytocin on the myometrium is mainly dependent on the concentration of the oxytocin receptors present. The highest concentration is in the uterine fundus. So we know that oxytocin works on other organs or even on the breast. If the woman is feeding, it's oxytocin that causes the nipple to be erectile and causes the myoepithelial cells to also erect and push out the blood content. So once they come in during pregnancy and during after delivery, all they do is to contract them. So contracting the uterus and contracting also the breast to bring out the breast milk. Egometrine is also used in the treatment and prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. It's also an oxytocin drug. It has significant side effects such as vomiting, nausea, and hypertension. So because of this, egometrine is sometimes losing um, its use. And it's only used when you have made sure that you don't have the woman, the woman is not having any increase in blood pressure. And then that is why when you have preeclampsia, which is a hypertensive condition in pregnancy, you don't administer egometrine. If you want to aid contraction, you go to other oxytocins like the oxytocin, but not egometrine. Now, egometrine can also come in preparation, in some other preparations called syntometrine. If you find syntometrine, it's a combination of syntocinone and egometrine. And they are used because one will counteract the side effects of the other. The drugs that may affect milk production. Some drugs may adversely affect milk production and therefore may not be recommended in breastfeeding. Like we said, all drugs that have estrogen as their base. In the normal physiology of lactation, estrogen and prolactin, estrogen and progesterone, when they are in high quantities, prolactin cannot work. So when prolactin comes in, then estrogen and progesterone must go away before we can establish lactation. Anytime we have estrogen in very high production, then these drugs may affect milk production. So any drug that has a very high estrogen concentration also affects lactation. It can even stop lactation completely. And this woman who was delivered with an engorged breast, the next moment the breast is dry as the breast of a non-pregnant woman. So we don't give estrogen preparations. An example is the bromocryptin and the carbogolin. They are all contraindicated during breastfeeding. Like doses of tyrosate, like that is diuretics, can also be passed on to the fetus. And then egotamine used in the treatment of migraine are also contraindicated during breastfeeding. And this brings us to the end of our very last session. And these are our references. So, so far we've come to the end of our course, Nurse 2 Thesis, Abnormal Pregnancy, Labor and Propurium.